So what is it like to move from a career in policing in Canada to one where you're sort of overlooking intelligence matters as they happen with the security agencies? As someone who worked in national security for more than three decades, as, as you know, I have in both uh, signals intelligence and in, in human intelligence, I had an awful lot of time for law enforcement. Never was a law enforcement officer myself, but worked very closely alongside the RCMP, Royal Canadian Mounted Police, and many municipal and provincial forces. I actually worked for the OPP, the Ontario Provincial Police's anti-terrorism section, for a bit when I so-called retired from the security service. And so I got to know a lot of law enforcement officers, and I have a lot of time for, for them and the work that they do. One thing I'm, I'm not entirely... I don't know, uh, comfortable with is uh, working with other government officials at times, especially in Canada, where I, I think we suffer from a real immature intelligence culture and appreciation for intelligence. I don't think we're nearly as, as good as other nations are in this regard. To look at these issues and more, I am absolutely thrilled to welcome to the podcast today, uh, Vern White, who is a senator in the Senate of Canada. He was appointed for Ontario back in February 2012. Before that, uh, Senator White worked with the RCMP. He was the chief of police for Durham Region, which is outside of, outside of Toronto, as well as the city of Ottawa itself. He has a, a huge amount of experience in these matters and is currently a member of what we call the National Security and Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians, NSI COP. So Fern, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thank you very much. Good to hear your voice, Phil. It's been uh, too long. COVID, I think, has shown all of us the importance of connections and relationships and the social connections in particular. So I miss that. So it's good to talk to you. Yeah. And I, if memory serves me correct, Brent, we met in Australia, of all places, back in, I believe, January of 2016, where I was uh, doing a, a keynote to a, to a terrorism conference. Is that when we first met? Yeah, I was in Brisbane. Yeah, we, uh, you were speaking, I was speaking on, uh, I did a panel on uh, youth intervention when it came to restorative practices for young people who were caught up in the uh, terrorism dragnet style. Um, not dissimilar to some of the people who were caught up in the Toronto 18. And uh, you gave a keynote there at the same time. That's right. Yeah. Oh my God. All that time ago. How time, I said, how time flies. Wow. Five and a half years later, and yeah, COVID and everything. Vern, you you had um, had quite the career in policing here in Canada, and, and something I'm always curious about when I talk to law enforcement officials such as yourself. What is your understanding of national security within a Canadian context? Well, you know, it's a funny it's a funny question because it would have shifted dramatically from the time I was a police officer uh, in the beginning, anyway, until later when I was more senior role. Um, most of my policing career in the RCMP was in the Arctic. I did almost 19 years in the North. Um, and certainly from a national security perspective, I would have looked much more small NS versus large NS. Um, you know, the security issues that face Canada internally rather than um, the threats that come from abroad, I think. Um, so, so, from a, so, so from that perspective, my, my thinking would have shifted. When I came to Ottawa as an assistant commissioner of the RCMP, of course, I was exposed to the much larger national security issues. You now, things like uh, even back then, concerns around um, potential cyber attacks from uh, external countries like, like China and, and uh, Russia as examples. Um, and then when I became a police chief in Ottawa, certainly I, I got exposed to the bigger issues around national security, primarily as a result of the politicization of a city like this where you hear the political discussion and dialogue, not just the police discussion and dialogue. And since I've been in the Senate, of course, my perspective has grown dramatically looking at some of the, you know, I, when I look at national security, I look at not only from, uh, you know, the cyber threats of certain countries, but also the impact on our economic security um, or through COVID, whether or not COVID was um, is being impacted by national security interests. And certainly we've seen a growth, for example, in fraud cases and scams against people uh, during COVID, different types of scams. Um, but, you know, it's interesting. I, I listened to a deputy commissioner with the RCMP a few years ago who said, and I agree with him um, to some level at least, that one of our greatest national security threats is organized crime. I don't think most Canadians would think about that. 
And I think it's in, you know, one of those, because that individual deputy commissioner had a, t- a tremendous breadth and depth of experience, I think he could understand that we can have, um, we can have issues around national security that aren't typically what we would identify as national security. Back to the organized crime issue. You look at Australia where they'll have about $18 billion move through that country as a result of money laundering this year. And you try to tell me that's not a national security threat against their economic security, against their their real GDP versus perceived GDP as an example. So I think national security is a bit of a balloon. You know, you can shape it and you can grow it and diminish it based on how much oxygen you can add to it. So I, so I do think it uh, has shifted over my past 25 years in policing and then more recently in the last nine years in the Senate. I really like the point you raised about organized crime because, of course, we've been led to believe that organized crime is purely a criminal issue, which, you know, obviously law enforcement, whether it's the RCMP or local jurisdictions have to worry about it. But as you said, it truly does have national impact. I, I think there, we might run into some difficulty if we're trying to label organized crime figures as terrorists per se. But as you said, that doesn't mean they're not necessarily a national security threat. It's just that it's a different kind of national security threat, if I understood you correctly. Absolutely. That, and, and in fact, I teach a course at uh, Charles Sturt University on, uh, on transnational organized crime, and probably 30% of that focus is separating terrorism from, not, from organized crime, but at the same time, understanding that both can have um, can be an, a, an interest of national security agencies because of the impact they can have on the security of a nation, right? I mean, on whether that's the impact on our economy, uh, infrastructure, particularly critical infrastructure, not always is it a terrorist act. Sometimes it's because people would like certain things to happen so that other things can happen in the country that make it uh, more susceptible to organized crime. I think, you know, you, you and I both lived through 9-11, and I think that the national security lens certainly shifted on that day where it almost, I think for a lot of people, terrorism was the only national security threat. So I think your reminder about organized crime is a particularly apt one, Vern. You talked about your time in Ottawa. You were the chief of Ottawa police for a while. Ottawa, as you said, is a special kind of town. Um, Obviously, it's the seat of government. We have parliament here. We have the Senate here where you're currently sitting. I imagine that as the chief of Ottawa police, you obviously have the responsibility for law and order in the city of Ottawa. But given it's the national capital, we have what's called the national capital region here in this part of the country. You must have come up with some interesting jurisdictional issues um, with the RCMP, be it, you know, security of parliament, uh, security of the Senate, uh, VIP protection. Obviously, lots of, you know, foreign heads of state come to Ottawa. Can you walk us through what what that was like to deal with those, you know, who's who in the zoo and who's in charge of things when it comes to national security while you were the chief of Ottawa police? Yeah, sure. You know, it's interesting because I saw it as well in Durham. Uh, I was the chief in Durham during the Toronto 18 investigation. Uh, Of course. um, When, uh, you know, CSIS, RCMP were managing a large, difficult, um, um, difficult and and diverse investigation because of the jurisdictional challenges, right? Those individuals were involved in some activities, training activities in in the region of Durham, as an example. That's right. I remember that, yeah. And, and at the same time, we had two nuclear power plants, which, of course, for us were extremely vulnerable or, or, or potential targets, at least, if there's somebody was going to be involved in a terrorist act. So, so in that well, case... Sorry, in actual fact, Vern, that the Toronto 18 did talk at one point of, right. of attacking a nuclear power plant. Yeah, they did, in fact. And 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 so so in that case there, I probably, and I'll go back to Ottawa in a second, but probably in Durham was a bigger challenge because it was across five large police agencies, um, you know, all in, in excess of a thousand officers, probably all in the top 12 or 13 police agencies size-wise in the country. Uh, dealing with the RCMP and CSIS and, and and challenged a little bit by the fact that a number of our uh, senior officers in those agencies weren't even security cleared to a level where they could have a frank discussion with CSIS about what we wow. were discussing, right? So, I mean, it was 2005, uh, six, seven when I was there. So, so during that period, I think that's when I really came to understand the importance of making sure that those 
you know, 198 give or take police agencies in this country have a better understanding of national security interests and, and, and challenges. And we're security cleared to a level whereby CSIS could walk in and have a discussion with the police chief and the deputies and the senior command team and say, look, here's what we have, here's what we're trying to do, and here's where we're going to go with it. Uh, because that wasn't the way Toronto 18 worked. It was very difficult for CSIS to have some of those discussions. And in fact, at times, they could have discussions with people in industry, in, in the critical infrastructure industry, particularly nuclear power, actually, that they couldn't have with some uh, police chiefs. And and that that is a dangerous place for this country. It's one of the reasons, if you can go back and watch any time I've uh, questioned the Minister of uh, Public Safety um, in, in a Senate committee meeting, I've always asked about the importance of uh, them setting standards for police agencies. I believe every police service in the country should have a standard by which the senior executive or security cleared to the highest level necessary to have those frank discussions. Still isn't required, sure. by the way. Still isn't For required. Sure. So that was probably the one where I saw the jurisdictional issues more difficult and, and to play out. Although with, I, I would argue, a very successful conclusion and great relationships built, um, there was an awful lot of uh, water with the wine to get there. In we Ottawa, were making, we were making some up uh, as we went. In other words, a hundred percent, hundred percent, and 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 they did a great job. I I don't want to diminish the importance and the success of that investigation. Um, in Ottawa, it was a little different because in Ottawa, we've always had this push pull between the Ottawa Police, a little bit of the OPP, in some cases the SQ and Gatineau, and of course the RCMP, and and having a large CSIS office here as well. <laughs> All of those things came to play a lot. So, you know, we would have upwards to 300 protests and demonstrations in the city of Ottawa every of year. Yes. So ne negotiating those protests and understanding the impact it could have, because a lot of the time it would cross on, at that time into the jurisdiction of the RCMP by encroaching on Parliament Hill. Um, we actually had that down pretty well, I, I would argue. And I can tell you where I thought it played out best was on October 22nd, 2014, okay. when the shooter went to Parliament Hill. You can look at that day um, and you can see the clarity and understanding of jurisdictional responsibilities uh, by the manner in which that was handled. We had Ottawa police officers helping RCMP and parliamentary security um, uh, personnel uh, clearing buildings and rooms and buildings on Parliament Hill. I'm not sure that every other jurisdiction in the world actually would have that relationship uh, to that level that it was it was so clear that, you know, first and foremost was getting the job done. Secondary was whose job it was to get done. Um, so I, I, I think in Ottawa, I had anticipated it would be much more difficult from that perspective than it was. It it really was a great relationship. I mean, we had things going like at the time we had seconded dozens of officers to the RCMP. A number of them um, were working PMPD, traveling around the country with the prime minister's protective detail. Like, I think we did a lot of things to ensure that we had a good blend of understanding and knowledge. We had an RCMP inspector working and assigned to us. We had a couple of uh, Ottawa police uh, inspectors assigned to the RCMP doing frontline RCMP duties as the inspector from the RCMP was doing with us frontline Ottawa police service duties. So I think that the, the hard work that's gone in well before my time uh, paid dividends and it continues to pay dividends and how important that relationship has become. Just a reminder to my listeners who aren't as familiar with Canada, uh, when Vern talked about the October 22nd, 2014, that was the attack by an ISIS wannabe named Michael Zahapi Bo, who went to the National Cenotaph and, and fatally killed Nathan Cirillo, who was a corporal standing on guard duty, and then rushed Parliament before he was, he was down in a hail of bullets. And, and as Vern said, it was a it was an amazing day. I mean, I was not at CSIS that day. I was at Public Safety Canada. And I'm sorry, I was retired. Um, no, I was at Public Safety Canada. No, that's not right. I was actually briefing Ontario Provincial Police and Terrorism in um, in Coburg with um, just before I retired. So anyhow, I've lost track of where I was at the time. That's okay. Moving on a little bit, Vern, um, you're now involved. You remember what's called the National um, Security Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians, NSI COP. What exactly is that body and, and, and what is it doing for us here in Canada? Well, you know, it's... it's uh... 
not dissimilar to a, a model that's used in the United Kingdom. Australia has it and the U.S. have a similar model as well. You'll always know the U.S. model because the minute they leave a private um, top secret briefing, they tell the public everything they've heard and seen, uh, unlike ours. <clears throat> so our committee members, uh, the only committee uh, of parliamentarians, uh, not a parliamentary committee, but a committee of parliamentarians that sits with members from both houses, <clears throat> all hold top secret security clearances, and we're permanently bound to secrecy under the Security of Information Act. So it's a, a to say that is that you would you would have seen we've been sitting now for the past almost four years, I guess, or more than four years, <clears throat> and very few people have heard much from us other than to see our reports, uh, which are often are uh, vetted in some manner by um, as a result of some of the areas that have to be protected, like ongoing investigations. But in essence, our job is to um, receive classified briefings, look at the different material that's performed by the 17 or so um, organizations that uh, in the government of Canada that have a security um, mandate, like CSIS, obviously, RCMP, um, but even areas such as national defense, which has an extremely large uh, national security and intelligence uh, area as well. I think, you know, they expend upwards to eight, seven or eight hundred, a hundred million dollars a year in that area, making it one of the largest national security intelligence uh, departments that the government of Canada has. So we look at the work. We don't deal with public complaints like other agencies might. Instead, we look at the work being performed. And we try to evaluate and assess and then report back as to whether we, we think it's performing in the manner that, first of all, Parliament expects, but secondly, that the public might expect. Because as uh, David McGinty, the chair, often says, you know, if I'm asked a question on the bus when I'm going downtown, I want to be able to explain clearly um, so that, you know, anybody can understand the type of work we're doing. And I think uh, we do a very good job of that. Now, there are times when things are referred to us. <clears throat> as an example, a trip to India a number of years ago by the Prime Minister where there were questions raised about certain individuals that are invited to um, events in India during that trip that we've done an, an also done a review and an investigation on, in that case. It's not the norm for us, but I think it is I think it is an area that's expected of us. Um, so we do those things as well. but but I, I think primarily our focus is trying to ensure that um, ensure that the work of our agencies is meeting what we have come to expect of our agencies. And CSIS is a great example. If you look at their beginnings back in, I guess, 84, does that make sense, Phil? 84, that's right. July of 84, yeah. the old RCP security <laughs> service. Yeah. So so back then, if, if we look at the work that was expected of them then and the work that they're providing today, we would see a dramatically different agency. Um, but I can argue having seen what I've seen and spoken to other countries that have similar agencies, um, that they are punching up every single day and probably are a leader in many of the areas that uh, we have placed expectations on them. So our job is to review, look at some of the work that they're doing, and try and uh, identify that the activity is carried out in accordance with the expectations of Parliament and Canadians, and then report back on that. And, and I think uh, it's probably been the uh, best time I've had in the Senate is working on this committee. It's probably the most hours I've put in as well. Um, but it really does give me a real understanding of the expectations and a real understanding of where Canada's uh, hard work is uh, is paying off and also maybe some of the challenges and things we need to improve upon going forward. Not surprised you're liking it, Vern, given the fact that you spent as many decades as I did in, in policing and national security. You mentioned other countries. I'm, I'm glad you raised that point. It's almost your kind of um, forecast, my, my next question. You know, I spent 32 years with CSE and with CSIS, as I mentioned earlier. I always got the impression that, in a general way, that Canada and the Canadian government more particularly have what's been called a poor intelligence culture. That's not to say that we didn't have fans and we didn't have supporters. We certainly did. I knew a lot of clients that we had at uh, when I was at CSE, especially that would, you know, they would delay meetings until they got the intelligence on what was going to happen. You know, if it was a foreign partner, for example. 
Other countries, I think, do things differently. And I would argue in some ways there's a better appreciation, let's say, United States, United Kingdom for what intelligence can do and, and how it can be used. Would you agree with that sentiment that we here in Canada aren't quite as up to speed as some of our Five Eyes partners when it comes to an understanding and use of intelligence? I think we are challenged greatly by the Canadian public's perspective of what they ex- of their of intelligence culture. Uh, the day after the shooting on Parliament Hill, I think Canadians across the country would have allowed our intelligence agencies to participate in anything the agencies felt was necessary to keep us safe. Two weeks later, that would have shifted back to where we were before, thinking, well, we, this never happens to us. Do we really need to right. go that far? <laughs> um, Canadians' memories about the good times are extremely good, and our <laughs> memories about the poor times are extremely poor. <laughs> so I think it's our, our poor intelligence culture, quote-unquote, is driven in part by Canadians' poor understanding of the real impacts that can be out there. I look at Canadian security establishment one of the best in the world agencies at what they do. Most Canadians don't even know they exist. And in fact, probably up exactly. until 10 years ago, didn't tell anyone they existed, right? One of the best in the world. <laughs> and I, I spoke uh, two weeks ago to the, the um, cybersecurity ambassador for Australia, a guy named Toby Feakin, real good guy, very bright guy. And uh, about, you know, the challenges they face there and, and from a cybersecurity perspective. And, and in essence, the issues they're facing are very much operational. Uh, whereas here with CSE, the operational side, I think, is probably, and you could, you could agree or disagree, uh, Phil, but probably at the, the, the leading edge, if not the bleeding edge of cyber impact and, and cyber defense, right? Absolutely. Um, and, and yet most Canadians don't even know it. And, and we don't necessarily see a need to tell them about it or explain to them the great work they're doing because instead we'll wait till something uh, happens and, and we will deal with it. And as a result, we will have probably defended more often than not. So, so I think our poor intelligence culture is kind of a Canadian thing, you know, I'm sorry, rather than what was that again? <laughs> <laughs> right? I think we drive this. It's, it's too bad. I think our government... A publicly probably feeds into that or allows it to be fed. Privately, I don't see that. And I've lived through, you know, uh, two, uh, two different governments, one liberal and one conservative. Um, and both of them, I think, in, in the closed rooms are very understanding of what's, what they're doing and what's expected of those agencies and the work that's being done and appreciative of it. But publicly, hardly even talk about it. Have you heard mm-hmm. national security brought up once during this election? <laughs> I, except for Afghanistan, I don't think we have. I don't yeah. think it's come up, right? Which is too bad when we talk about the fact that right now cybersecurity is probably one of our greatest threats, particularly uh, cybersecurity in relation to specific countries who are targeting Canada and others. And, you know, I, I'm a little disappointed we're not hearing about it, but it's probably because the public doesn't see it as an issue. Well, and yeah, you know, you're well aware too, Vern, that obviously if you're running for office, you want to address the issues that your constituents want to hear about. And if no one's beating down, batting down the, or beating down the window saying, talk about security, why would you talk about it? And I think you're absolutely right. I, I think that Canadians do have a poor understanding of security. And, you know, get back, getting back to CSE, of course, when I joined CSE, which is when dinosaurs walked the earth, um, <laughs> we, we, we didn't even exist publicly. There was no such thing as CSE in That's the public right. domain. Uh, in fact, it was a senator, Jean-Luc Pépin, in the fall of 1983, just after I joined, who actually told Canadians about this ultra-secret organization. And I remember that day we were told, you know, when you get out the door, there might be a CBC camera there. Don't say anything. I think it was one or two cameras. And the next day it was, you know, crickets kind of thing. But you are right. I think Canadians do have a, a rather poor understanding of national security. And yes, we do apologize far too much for far too many things, but uh, it is getting better. And it's getting better in part, I think, to people like you, Vern, who've gone on from your law enforcement career onto the Senate and, and with NSI COP and trying to raise these issues. So, you know, don't take this too, uh, too, too um, much to heart, but I'd like to thank you, first of all, for your service as a law enforcement officer in Senate and, uh, and secondly, for joining me on the podcast today. Thanks, Phil. You know what? It was great talking to you, and I appreciate uh, talking about issues other than what I typically talk about, so it's appreciated. That was my, set, my conversation with, with Senator Vern White. 
who is part of a National Security Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians. What did you think of our conversation about intelligence in Canada and, and jurisdictional issues? I'd love to hear your feedback. You can reach me on email borealisrisk at gmail.com or on Twitter at borealisage. You can also find me on LinkedIn and on Facebook. If you want to find out more, go to borealisthreatenrisk.com. All the podcasts and blogs are there, as well as a link to my newest book, The Peaceable Kingdom, History of Terrorism in Canada from Confederation to the Present. It's only available on the website as it's self-published. Love to hear your feedback. We'll talk again soon. Until then, stay safe.